Hi everybody, welcome back to Cinema. I hope you got to watch the rest of Three Idiots last week, either here in class or online, or maybe you pursued it on your own. That really helped confirm and finish up our section on mise-en-scene. And with regard to mise-en-scene, that is a very important part of cinema because it's a lot of extra information that we get from what is in the frame. And I believe your journal assignment has you pause a film at a certain point and then describe everything that's in the frame and how that adds up to meaning. Also how it attracts attention to items that we want to use to further the narrative construction. Mise-en-scene is very much part of the narration, the setting, lights, costuming, actors' movements, props, all these things that go into providing an atmosphere in which the story can take place. What we want to be able to do is recognize how some of these things can become a motif. And I have brought up the concept of a cinematic motif several times. For instance, in Whale Rider, I brought up the people sleeping in angled beds at moments of tension. That becomes a cinematic motif. The use of angles to illustrate tension in the narrative, that is a cinematic motif. When we uh, see anything repeated over and over, that is put in the film to give it unity. And remember the, the concept of motif really comes from the musical term motif or motive, which is that primary riff, that introductory element, the melodic hook, the thing that you remember that you can whistle or hum that comes from a song because that typically occurs at the beginning of the song and then maybe in the chorus of a song and then maybe in the solo part and then it returns at the end and that's what gives that song cohesion is that short melodic riff or hook reappearing to give that song unity. Same thing happens in cinema. And sometimes a prop can provide that unity in a narrative sense. So if we remember in Three Idiots, the pen that was brought up early on by the director, and then it returned at the end at the climactic point of the film, and then returned again at the very end of the film. So a prop can also be a motif. And as your book notes, sometimes the very simplest choices can have the most impact. And that leads us up to how we view these things through the lens and leads us up to chapter five and the shot, talking about cinematography. So far, what we have done is discussed the narrative structure, how a story is put together, and then subsequent to that, how we interpret a story, what kind of themes it has, what's it about, what does it mean? So we were able to come up with several with regard to Whale Rider, for example, about it being about generational issues, cultural issues, age issues. And then with regard to Three Idiots, we were able to bring up themes of education and its purpose, the mental well-being of students, and how cultural reinforcements of what we are supposed to be are often put on us by our parents or society. And we either try to measure up to or match up to what's expected of us by parents and society, or we go on our own path. We decide we wanna do what's best for us. And only we know that. Not that we shouldn't take some wise advice from our elders, teachers, parents, whoever those people are that have some experience in life and might be able to tell you a couple things. But you may have had the experience of your parents telling you something and you thinking, there's no way that is how I'm gonna go about it. And then you go about it your own way and you realize, you know what? My parents actually knew something because they have been here on the planet for a little while. So with regard to the shot, when we talk about cinematography, this is really what we're getting down to, shooting the images. 
and the way in which the director works with the cinematographer to depict what we're going to see on screen. All of us make choices regarding how we shoot video with our cell phones, which I was going to hold up, but I dropped. So we make decisions with our cell phones. We decide to shoot landscape like this because maybe it's going to go to YouTube or some other social media platform. But we know if we're shooting for TikTok or a reel on Instagram, what? It's got to be like this, right? Vertical. Sometimes we're hearing, I've heard a new term called vertical cinema now, where it's all shot like this because people don't want to turn their phones when they're watching video on their phone. They want to keep it this way. So you can just keep scrolling. So you have to make a decision. Do you want to shoot like this or do you want to shoot like this? Or do you want to do both? Well, if something is happening at the moment, you have to make a choice as to where you think it's going to wind up. Is it going to wind up on a big screen somewhere? Is it going to wind up on a television? Is it going to just wind up on somebody's phone? And I don't mean to limit the phone significance because we all have them and that's how most of us watch most things these days, it seems. So just with your phone, you're making cinematographic decisions. But not only that, if you open your phone's camera, you can see you have various settings where you can make it a certain width. You can change the dimension of it. And this particular phone I have, the Samsung phone, has a full uh, way to shoot that if you shoot this way, it won't even fit on some things. It's too big. There's like a little extra over here and a little extra over here. But that's the way uh, televisions are going to evolve. The phones and the TVs are closely aligned. And I would also mention, as I have before, if you're driving by Catusa in the Hard Rock Casino, look at the giant video board they have up there now. It's not like this. It's not landscape. It's vertical. And so everything that's done for that video board has to be done vertically like this. So it's not just what kind of uh, camera you use and what you decide your dimensions are going to be or whatever your settings are going to be. Do you need a light? Do you need a flash? All that kind of thing. Well, this isn't a video production class. This is a cinematic appreciation class. But still, you can think with your own phones that you could record something that could go viral on your phone. Millions of people might see it if it's the right moment and the right visual image. If it's short enough and funny enough, as we typically say now, that's how things tend to go viral. Unless it's a conflict of some type where you become the news reporter of the moment. And so I'm sure you've noticed videos where two people are fighting or they're yelling at one another or there's like I saw somebody trying to get a shark out of the water on the beach the other day. You have the people that are pulling the shark out of the water and then you've got five or six people and everybody's holding their phones up, you know, like getting shots of it. And we see this in restaurants when somebody's all upset about whatever. And as soon as the fight begins, everybody gets the phones out. So we have a society of documentarians now constantly going around with their phones, breaking it out. You go to a concert, everybody's holding their phones up. And, you know, a lot of times watching the concert on their phone that way. So when you get home, you can relive it again. And for some people, the audio is not really an issue. They just want to see it again. And that gets into all kinds of other things. But we're all walking around with a camera now. Everybody. I don't know anyone who doesn't have a cell phone. My 83-year-old mother has a cell phone. She didn't really know how to use it very well, but she definitely has one. So the question is, how are you going to shoot? Are you going to always have a handheld camera where it's always moving around every time you take a breath? The camera moves up and down. Are you going to learn to put it on some kind of fixed base before you shoot? Do you have a stick or a cane or anything that you can set on end and put it like that so at least it's a stable shot? Well, again, these are video production concepts, but it gets to this point of the handheld camera. And I was bringing this up with regard to Three Idiots because the handheld camera is an important cinematographic 
device and technique. Because with that handheld camera, you're implying reality. You're implying a documentary function. Or you have an unstable frame, so therefore the narrative is unstable at that point. The character is unstable at that point. If the context is right, like everything else we've talked about here in cinema, it has to be the right context. You can interpret something however you wish, but if it's not in the right context, given the narrative or what's happening in the story, then that's your supposition, you know, your opinion, which is a lot of what artistic interpretation is, opinion, based in experience and fact. So when we start to look at the way films are shot, we have a lot of different ways to look at the individual shots. And we're going to go through some of those today. As your book notes, cinematography literally means writing in movement. Writing in movement, which comes from the concept that photography gives us, which is writing in light. So when you think about these things and start to look at movement in front of your camera, and, and to me, I'll go ahead and say this, one of my favorite things to watch is not just a gloriously staged shot of one person in a frame. What I enjoy the most is watching figures in the frame moving as the camera moves at the same time because so much planning goes into that. And I know uh, one student, Caden back there, is doing a short film project. And so we got him to do a shooting script where that's a really important part of creating a plan for film. Not just the concept and the story and the dialogue, but what does the camera do in each individual moment? And so that requires you to think beyond the concept of the story, the narrative, the dialogue between the characters, and you're actually thinking about what's the camera going to do? How am I going to show this? So there are a lot of ways that we can uh, look at this technically with regard to exposure or lens and these kinds of things that if you're a cinematographer, you ultimately are going to have to work with these things. What a filter does if you put it on the lens and how that changes everything. The speed of the camera. Uh, the, we're not shooting film anymore, so we don't really have to worry about that, but you can set a digital video camera to replicate the frames per second of a film camera, which is about 24 frames per second, is what an old film camera originally did. So essentially you got 24 still images in that uh, second and those still images racing by the projector light is what creates the illusion of movement. And as the book notes, if you watch a silent film, Caligari, for example, that we watched in here the very first couple weeks of class, very smooth. It might as well be a modern digital uh, work of cinematography because it's that 24 frames a second is very smooth. It keeps all the motion going very smoothly. But we won't focus on these kinds of things as much as we start to go through these. Uh, I have some tutorials that we'll watch a couple of today. We'll see if we can get through a couple of these. And they're from a, a course uh, from a few years ago, a different textbook, but they, they are really good introductions to the camera and how it works, especially in cinema. One of the things that I'm always working with is the lens size. So I shoot a lot of um, still images with my DSLR, which is a digital single lens reflex camera. And I often have to decide, do I want the zoom lens so I can get in closer, or do I want a shorter lens so that I can be closer? So if I'm gonna be, well, my example would be this last Saturday night, I was shooting some still images at a function which uh, had a lot of music on stage. And so I took my zoom because I know I'm not gonna be able to get really close or closer than maybe 10 to 20 feet in front of the stage, even though I have a media pass. So I can basically go where I want to, but it's not appropriate unless you're shooting video and you have clearance to be on a stage to be roaming around the stage with your 
camera as a performance is going on. But what you can do is be in front of the stage. And with a zoom, you can get right up on a good medium close-up or a close-up of anybody that's playing music. Or I can go to the back of the arena, up on some stairs, and get a nice wide shot of everybody with the zoom. But with the zoom, I can't get a wide shot if I'm too close. So there are various decisions that you have to make, and I don't want to be changing lenses and have another lens in my pocket, and all, so I just went with my zoom because I knew I could get the shots that I wanted using it. And that does change your framing. One of the things that we also look at is depth of field as it relates to deep focus. You saw a little bit of this in one of the tutorials on mise-en-scene where it was looking at the film Citizen Kane, which uses the concept of deep focus cinematography over and over and over, wherein we have three levels of narrative information. We have that that's in the very front of the screen, close up. We have that that's in the middle ground, and then we have that that's in the background. And so we saw a scene from Citizen Kane where Citizen Kane, or uh, Charles Foster Kane, when he's a child, uh, his mother is signing some uh, custody papers from, for him. And she's in the foreground with the banker. And then the father, who doesn't really have a decision in the whole situation, is in the middle ground. And then the boy is all the way in the background through a window playing in the snow. But you can see all three of those levels. This, a couple of films before that had used deep focus photography. Um, I would immediately go to Rules of the Game, which is a French film from the 1930s that uses deep focus photography. And sometimes it's comedic, where they have something happening in the front, and then something happening in the middle ground, and something happening all the way in the background. The early John Ford films, the westerns that have John Wayne in them, they often use deep focus photography because you might see a, a stagecoach way off in the distance and two characters right in the front of the frame and they're talking. And as they're talking, that stagecoach gets closer and closer and closer and closer and closer until it's finally where they are. And that's accomplished with this deep focus photography. So we'll look at how that works. I don't focus a whole lot on special effects. I think we know when a special effect happens. A special effect is when something is taking place electronically that would not be able to be accomplished with simply the camera pointed at something. If you're familiar with what a green screen is, that's a green background where we can put any figure in front of that green background. And then once that put into the computer, we can put any image we want behind the character on that green background. This is the way weathermen and women do the weather. So they're standing in front of a green screen. This is not a green screen, by the way, this thing. It's an actual set piece. They're looking at a monitor that has their forecast and all the radar and everything on it. And they're sort of pointing to the monitor, not really what's the green screen behind them. So that's put behind them. If you ever saw the, the Anchorman TV show, it had Will Ferrell in it. And the second one, he wears green pants out on the set. And so his legs disappear. And he has a comedic moment of thinking, you know, something bad has happened to his legs, when in fact, he's just wearing green pants standing in front of the green screen. So you see the invisible man from the waist down. I think that that comes into the mat work realm. And of course, what they used to do, and we see this in uh, Casablanca, there's a car scene. And what they would do is literally run a film behind the characters with landscape going by. So it looks like they're driving, but really it's two people in a, a car on a set with the background being provided by a rear screen projection. That's not necessary anymore, obviously. So, and that's rear projection is mentioned here in your book. We can also use special effects to change things digitally, change the color, uh, do all kinds of things. You know, the, the video editing software now allows us to zoom in to a situation where we might've been zoomed too wide so for example, I shoot football on Friday night and 
when I'm shooting football because there's so much action going on and I'm never exactly sure which way it's going to go, I keep a wide shot. That way, whatever happens in front of me and I follow it, I'm then in post-production able to go in and use the video editing software and zoom in via the video editing software to where the play is happening and have it a little more isolated on the screen. All this leads us up to framing. And so sometimes you might see a director who's doing this, this number, right, with their hands. And why are they doing this? Because that more or less replicates the video or the film size. So if you think in terms of this, you know, it's essentially that, right? So you don't need to look with a camera in your hands. You can just do this number and go, yeah, that's going to more or less work that way. I can frame it that way. Because framing obviously is very important to how we are going to see things. It will dictate what part of the mise-en-scene impacts us, what we're going to see in the frame. But then also, as you will see in the tutorials, and I mentioned this very early in the class as an example, this is where we start to talk about angles and what we would either call proxemics or proximities, which means how close does the camera appear to the subject? And we say appear because the zoom can get you closer. Now, typically, we don't zoom while filming. We zoom in, get our shot, and then start unless we're doing a documentary of some type or we're trying to get a certain effect that you'll see demonstrated in one of the tutorials. One of my favorite things to try and do, and I've done it a few times and used it a couple places, is the reverse zoom. We see it in horror movies a lot. It really became popularized in the film Jaws. This is where when you have a camera, as you, let's just say you zoom in. So if you're using your zoom function on your camera, which I would do with my little buttons here, you would walk backwards as you zoom in and it creates a reverse odd effect or you would zoom in, let's say no, zoom out as you're moving the camera in. So you reverse move which are against whichever way you're zooming and it changes the perspective in a really unique way. But we normally see that in horror films, the reverse zoom. So let me uh, go a little bit further here. Uh, I don't think we need to do the, this is where we get into camera position, angling. I've already brought up some of these things in the first couple of films that we've seen. With regard to angle, Really, there's just a few that we need to remember and be able to interpret. I have probably over accentuated the canted angle or tilted angle. Uh, numerous times in Three Idiots, we saw it in Whale Rider. Uh, it's all, the foundation of it is in Caligari that we saw, which is why I always work with that film. Once you know that a canted angle is used for moments of tension, you'll see it over and over and over again. You can't unsee it. Similarly, with regard to a low angle shot, looking up at a figure, it invests that figure with power if the context is right. Or a high angle shot looking down at something limits the power of that figure depending on the context. Because there are occasions where we might see a high angle shot or a low angle shot that's used artistically, but not necessarily with the meaning that is implied by the typical use of that angle. In addition to that, we have the sometimes called the bird's eye point of view or the God point of view or extreme high angle. All three are really correct, but it's where we look down on something from above as if we are a celestial being watching what's happening beneath us or a bird watching what's happening beneath us. And I think one of the PowerPoints or not PowerPoints, but tutorials, or maybe it's the Hitchcock one. They talk about a really interesting point of view, which is there's a film called The Birds, which is one of Hitchcock's more famous horror films. And there's a point where you have the bird's point of view, and it's kind of a cinematic joke because we have this bird's eye view shot, and here, sure enough, we have a bird 
that's looking down on the havoc that's just been caused by the birds. And that really also gets into point of view. Through whose eyes are we looking? Well, often when a film begins and we're introduced to a main character, we know that this is their point of view. So in Whale Rider, we knew that that was Pykeon. That was her story. She told it to us. In Three Idiots, it was um, Farhan. He was the storyteller. Because he start, it was his voice early on. He's the one that took us through the whole thing. So point of view is important. That's why the Hitchcock film Rear Window is so cool. Because it's about an injured photographer sitting in his apartment who then starts to see some nefarious activity happening in the apartments behind him or on, on the other side of the courtyard from his window. And so at a certain point, he starts using his camera to watch what's going on. He uses a zoom lens to watch what's going on. So then think about this story is essentially his story. It's his perspective. But think about that being shot. We have Hitchcock, whose vision it is, who's looking through his cinema camera, his film camera, looking at a character who's looking through their camera through a window into another window. And so there's all these levels of perspective that you get in Rear Window that the more you think about it, the more you realize the artistry that's gone into this whole thing. From Hitchcock to his cinematographer to the actor through that camera to the action that that actor is looking at through his camera. With regard to, I already brought up canted angle, we talked about that. Height, low angle, high angle, bird's eye shot. And then we get into distance. And I'm gonna use the document camera here. Alrighty, we'll flip over to that. And these are the different shots that we have where we would start to talk about how distances work. So in the extreme long shot, we basically can see a big shot of the city. We know where this is taking place. Often this is used as an establishing shot. It gives us a sense of setting. The extreme long shot then gives over to the long shot. And here we can see the figures in the frame, right here. And then a lot of their surrounding. But it is almost always full figures from head to toe with a lot of their setting. And you see there's a difference in the extreme long shot, which is a big setting. Okay, the 